Welcome everyone to the first ever dark match edition of the Smack Talk podcast from SmartOutMoment.com. I am your host, as always, Tony Mango. With me on the mic this evening, we have Sean Walker. Hey, hey, hey. Michael Burhan. I don't want to live anymore. <laughs> and Stephen Wago. I luckily only had to see one match of this shit. Before we begin, what's the dark match segment? Well, now that you can find Smack Talk on iTunes and Stitcher on top of youtube.com slash smartoutmoment, I've decided that every once in a while I'm going to split something from the regular episode. Sometimes it's going to be something like this, where we do a pay-per-view review right after the pay-per-view. Sometimes it's going to be just us chit-chatting before an episode, or maybe we'll do live running commentary along with an event. Who knows? We'll switch it up every once in a while. But... I'm going to post this on iTunes and Stitcher, and later on in the week it will go up on the normal YouTube channel, but it's going to go on those other avenues first, so make sure that you guys check that out. This will be promoted everywhere, of course, to let you guys know what's happening. Uh, the later episode, later on in the week, the episode will in full happen, other than this segment that we had talked about before. So we're going to run down Hell in a Cell. We're going to do the trivia question of the week. We're going to do the hot tags, the outro, everything else that you're accustomed to. That stuff's not going to change. But we're just separating TNA's review from that, from uh, episode 103. So for this uh, first ever dark match, we're going to talk TNA's Bound for Glory event, which just ended several minutes ago. And we've decided to come together and give our rundown of the events that just transpired. This pay-per-view was awful. Uh, I don't necessarily know if I would say it's as bad as Battleground. We'll kind of maybe come to a judgment later on about that. But in general, this pay-per-view sucked. And we knew it was going to suck going into it. But I figured, hey, I'd give it a shot. And look at what happened. They proved me right. It ended up being awful <laughs> but we're gonna run it down anyway so let's start off with the countdown to bound for glory the pre-show was a number one contenders gauntlet match between bad influence chavo guerrero and hernandez joseph park and eric young and the bromans for the number one contendership to the tag team titles and let's talk about the idea of the pre-show itself wwe has been doing the pre-show for what a year and a half now maybe Something like that? Sounds about right. So TNA's like, fuck it, all right, we'll try to do it too, but we'll do it, uh, you know, significantly worse. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> let's take every WWE concept ever made and let's make it suck even more. It's like, you know those flaws that WWE has in that stuff? Let's do that, but not any of the good stuff. Not a big fan of that. Let's make it worse, come on. So, I mean, they had a decent idea here to do a number one contender gauntlet match. But... The booking Out of all of it, the people they pick. God, the booking of it was stupid as hell. You start off with bad influence in Chavo Guerrero. Nothing really happens. But Daniels rolls up Chavo, holds his tights, and they end up eliminating them from the team. Joseph Park and Eric Young come up next. And, you know, that's a, a stupid-ass team as it is. They eliminate bad influence. Now, I was kind of hoping that bad influence would win, but whatever. After they do that, the the uh, Bad Influence team attacks Park and Young, and lo and behold, Broman sense of winning. Now they come out with Mr. Olympia, who, it, com the whole wow oh, factor... Wait, did you say Mr. Anamanapia? <laughs> Mr. Olympia, whoever the guy's name oh, is. I have okay. no idea who the guy is, because I don't care. And if anybody <laughs> else is really supposed to care about that, it just went over... Uh, the total opposite way that they were expecting it to. They're like, wow, they've got Mr. Olympia. He's a new friend of theirs. You don't hear any fucking pop for him or anything like that. He's just some dude. But they end up winning, and their horrible theme song pops up multiple times, which if anybody wants to know one of the worst themes in wrestling right now, Bromance has to be one of them. Agreed. And it's a shame, too, because Robbie E. used to have a kind of entertaining theme. But kind of a pointless match. And if that's supposed to be one of the things that sells you on the pay-per-view, that you weren't sure that you were going to buy it or not, that's not going to really sell anything. 
But that leads us to the X Division Championship Ultimate X match, which was the beginning of the show. So let's break that down a little bit. Uh, I actually thought that this was a decent idea, starting off with cramming some of the people like Jeff Hardy into that that didn't have anything else to do, because what the hell, we're not going to have like Aces and Eights wrestle or anything, right? But, uh, Sean, what did you think about this match? I wasn't a big fan of it at all. I thought it was a lot worse than it could have been or should have been, considering it's an X Division match. I I thought it was very very slow for an X Division match. To be honest, it wasn't an well, it wasn't even an Ultimate X match. It was more of a ladder match than anything else. Really, it was very generic, very dull. The only good spot about it was um, Jeff Hardy's alley oop on um, I can't think what his name is on one of the guys on, on Seven. It was on Seven. No, I was on Austin Aries. Austin Aries was the only good thing about this match. Yeah, he pretty much was. Now, Steven, you didn't watch this, but what basically happened here was uh, we've got Manic, Austin Aries, Jeff Hardy, Samoa Joe, who's, you know, like far above and beyond that weight class that they used to have, and Chris Saban. And it's pretty awkward, but the most awkward part of the whole thing is the ending of it. Chris Saban tells Velvet Sky to get into the ring. And she kind of just stands around and goes like, what? Why? I don't know what to do. It's not like I'm a wrestler or anything. And Jeff Hardy's in the ring, and he just kind of points to her and just says like, hey, what are you doing here? I don't remember seeing you around the fucking ring before. And you know how like that kind of works with distractions and, you know, people, uh, you get, get out of the ring so you don't get hurt and all that that they usually do in WWE? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. You would expect that to happen, and then, you know, somebody to attack Jeff Hardy or something. Like hit him from behind. Right. Instead, Chris Saban just kind of casually walks up the ladder and gets the title. (laughs) Wait, they're using the ladder? Yeah. What the fuck? Didn't they used to climb the ropes? Yeah, they just bypassed that entirely. It was just like... I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, Joe, you're way too fat. The ropes are going to get... So he just kind of like, oh, you know, you're a little bit distracted. I think I'll just, like, mosey on up here, grab a title. How's this an Ultimate X match? It's a fucking ladder match. Yeah. Basically. Yep. Fuck. It's an it's a ladder match with uh two ropes or plastic above ropes the or ring. whatever above the ring that were used I think like twice. I think like Manic climbed it one time and just kind of like hang there a little bit and well, uh, did a couple kicks. Well, well, you guys are doing a good job of selling me to watch the, the pay per view back now. <laughs> yeah. If you want to watch it to go to sleep. It'll work. Yeah, but I want boring I want, as hell. I want pleasant dreams, not fucking nightmares. <laughs> well, Velvet Sky's dress was pretty, pretty pleasant. Isn't it bad that that's like a highlight? You just be like <laughs> Velvet Sky, who did nothing of value in this entire match, it was a highlight. So Chris Saban wins in the most bland way possible, which is really pathetic. So there was no sick bumps or anything. I don't remember any. Do you, Sean? Just the Jeff Hardy alley oop, and that's it. Yeah, it's really just. This is like such a half assed, pointless way to start off the pay per view, especially when they just had that tag match. Yeah, this is the type of. The crowd cut out, I know. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, this is the type of crowd that you want to get your fans hyped up for and be really cheerful. This is, uh, this is basically your fucking cruiserweight match that you'd stick on the beginning of the show. For your biggest pay-per-view of the year. And they fucked it. And they're like, I think that the way we need to end this is, like, the guy just needs to kind of walk up and get the title, and everybody else just goes like, eh, I don't really want it. <laughs> like, I guess you could just take it, Saban. Yeah, I was like, well, you fucked up being world champion. Here's this belt. <laughs> right. So they go and give him that title, and then this is their big payoff for that. And I guess he's going to be turning heel now, which that's not the first time tonight, uh, or not the only time tonight, I should say, that somebody wins a match and it seems like they're going to turn heel. We'll get to that a little bit later, but that was pretty pointless. So instead of riding what was supposed to be a good wave of going from you know this very energetic X Division type of, ma- type of match and going into something that's like got a whole lot of uh, fire behind it, they decide that they're going to go backstage and have Eric Young be like, oh man, oh shit, something's going to happen here. 
and a little bit later on, they pay off that. They go, Bad Influence comes out. Let's just backtrack a little bit and go to the tag title match again that you watched that wasn't really worth anything. They cut a promo saying, even though they lost, they should be in the tag title match, which prompts Eric Young to come out, who says, hey, remember how, like, two segments ago I said that, like, everybody should back away and everything? By the way, uh, Joseph Parks Abyss, if you're an idiot and you don't know that by now, he's going to come out and fight you two. So they're like, what? I don't know what I don't know what you're talking about, whatever. And of course, wait, 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 wait. Did they actually say that Joseph Parks abyss? No, but uh, they inclined it. He was oh. just like, you know, you created a monster and you should run and whatever. But give us a break, you know what I mean? Mm. Riveting television. The Joseph Park Oh, yeah. Instead of actually, you know, doing something big with that, they decided to just throw it out there. That's TNA in a nutshell. The only, re- the only reason I like the Joseph Park character is because he's not doing fucking sick bumps, barbed wire, and shit every single time he's out there anymore. Oh, yeah. Don't get me started on that bullshit. Yeah. That's the only fucking silver lining to him not being Abyss. I don't know. I um, hate Joseph Park. I think it's so stupid. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Abyss in general, but. Then the only other option you have is to cut the guy. I'd be fine with that. I mean, I'd be fine with them cutting about 75% of their roster. Which actually, yeah. that's what they're, they seem to be doing now that they don't have the money for it. Yeah, there's plenty of scrubs you can get off who work better anyway. Right. Like, uh, <laughs> what was his name? Norv? We'll get to that Norv. later. <laughs> we'll get to Norv later. <laughs> Fucking ridiculous. So... They transition from that tag title situation to the actual tag title match itself. James Storm and Gunner against Bromans, which means we have to hear that awful theme music again. And Mr. Olympia comes out to no pop again. And it the, again, this match is boring. I got a question to ask. Uh, was there a pop at all during the show? Because AJ got fuck all little later on. Uh, you know what? I think Abyss might have gotten a little bit of a pop. But, well, well, as Hulk Hogan said, he is the John Cena of the company. <laughs> but it wasn't, you know, significant. You're you're not hearing any um, John Cena returns from the 2008 Royal Rumble type of pops at this or anything. You're not even hearing like Monday Night Raw pops, essentially. But supposedly they didn't even sell out on this pay per view. To be fair, there was only three people in the crowd, according to Twitter. <laughs> You know what they had in the crowd? They just had, like, those standees. The those cardboard cards. cutouts. The card, yeah. <laughs> do, you think so... they had, do you think they had to pay fans to come in? <laughs> Probably did. <laughs> like, they um... had, like, uh, the things that you see on video games where you have, like, the same templates of, like, ten people. And it's oh. just spread out throughout the whole thing. <laughs> Shit, <laughs> no, they st- did. It, they it just... still looked better than WWE games uh, crowds. <laughs> It's just that for me, I don't. It's not that it makes sense it, in terms of the pay per view. I, I saw a picture of the bloody stadium, and the majority of those seats weren't even filled. Where, there's there's something even funnier about that that happens after this. But the uh, the tag title match, boring in my opinion, and they did one of the first instances of this night where they just come kind of completely threw out the rule book. We had the four people in the ring. Now, standard tag team operation, uh, operational procedures is you have to tag the person in. That's kind of the point of a tag team match. The four people were in the ring for maybe like five straight minutes. Referee just doesn't care whatsoever. But this same referee that doesn't pay any attention to that whatsoever allows Bromance to win after they hit James Storm with the title because he's not paying any attention. Because in TNA, even the referees can't bother to watch the matches. <laughs> so, at the end of it, Mr. Olympia, he you know he's celebrating a new tag team champions, Bromance, and he rips off his shirt. And he's like, ah, you know, I'm muscular and I don't do anything else in my life. And uh, he was going to be doing that when they won that first match. You could tell that he was going to, like, tear the shirt and then realized, oh, fuck, I'm supposed to do this later on when we win, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But, uh, Sean, since you watched this, what did you think about the tag match? Uh, I thought it was, like, a very bog-standard tag match. Nothing stood out apart from the tornado part in the middle of the match. That was it. Now... 
Burhan and Steven both came into this very, very late at the main event. So that's why we're giving them a little bit of a rundown of what happened. Sean and I watched the whole thing, unfortunately. You poor bastards. Unfortunately, I mean, yeah. I, it's good. I like Gunnar and James Storm's like the weirdest combination of fucking people to team as well. I think it's because they look a little alike. Well, no. Oh, it's, it's WWE's logic. Like, let's put the black guys together. <laughs> what it is, is because of the fact that they... James Storm had a thing with Robert Roode, and instead of making the feud of the year, which is what they were having, and giving them the title to actually feud over, they decided, no, no, we're going to play hot potato with the world title. We're going to put you in a tag team match against Roode while he's a tag champ with Austin Aries. No, he wasn't even the tag champ at this time. And we'll give you a partner. So who should we give you? Why not Gunner? The guy who has no charisma. Should have just brought Chris Harris back. Exactly. So it was just like, okay. They won the tag titles and they did nothing with the tag team championships for like months. At least he's better than Breed and Walker. Oh, don't hey, even stop. I actually, I actually like Chris Harris when he's, well, he was Chris Harris in TNA. The America's Most Wanted was a good tag team. I wasn't watching TNA at that. Well, I shouldn't say at that time. Well, it's not like I really well, watched TNA anyway. But well, they actually had a tag team that was main eventing, and that's when there was the the top of their game. But shit, that so that ship's well sailed years ago. Yeah, I've always heard good things about America's Most Wanted, but I've never actually gone back and watched old tapes or anything. Well, you could probably get them for free. Daniels and AJ, Daniels and AJ versus America's Most Wanted. Some really good matches. Uh. Referencing what we talked about earlier, the the messed up, pointless crowd and everything. The segment after this was such a funny example of the difference between TNA and WWE. Uh, they start plugging their whole Hall of Fame. And you know how WWE rents out a whole arena? And they make a big deal out of it. And you get like multiple people to show up and... You know, you you pay them quite a bit of money and you make like this big extravagant kind of thing and people are honored to do it. TNA's example, it looks like they basically rented out a conference room at a hotel and they can't even get proper lighting. The whole thing's like dark as hell and depressing. <laughs> it was so bad. It's like 20 people there. And they're like, Kurt yeah, Angle's it's like, the best. It's like, it's like, it's like with Kurt Angle's like, oh, that guy's still wrestling. <laughs> It's like they took people from the hotel itself and they were like, yo, you want to be a part of like this big honorable thing? And they're like, nah. <laughs> but that was we'll, we'll give you money. So Sting comes out to introduce Kurt Angle and he says like, hey, you know, I'm a little bit lonely in the Hall of Fame by myself. And, you know, they're they're building this up as like, oh, it's the biggest honor in professional wrestling history to be in TNA's uh, Hall of Fame, whatever. Like anybody really gives a damn. And Kurt Angle rejects the offer, saying he's let everybody down and he's not living up to his potential. So from now on, he'll be proving his worth. And, you know, once he becomes worthy enough, then he'll join. And then they just sort of walk away. And the crowd's just sort of like, what? (laughs) You can see this collective face over the crowd where they're just like, I I thought that this was going to make sense and matter. But all right, let's just go to the next segment. Like. Shouldn't that segment be on Impact, not fucking their big pay-per-view of the year? Right, and what, like, a good example of TNA, how pointless they are, where you've got one guy on the Hall of Fame, and then the next guy's like, you know, nah, nah, I don't really want to be in it. <laughs> like, nah, you're good. <laughs> it's like, nah, I'm kind of just waiting for that WWE contract to come through, so... You know, interesting note, though? Kurt Angle's been in TNA longer than he has WWE now. Really? Yep. Wow. Check it out. When yeah, but TNA? if you look at his time, short time in WWE, he did a hell of a lot more than he did in TNA. Yeah, no one's because... disputing. No one's disputing that. It's just a fun yeah. fact. I know. I'm just saying, if the tree like falls down in the woods, like, can you hear it? It's like if Kurt Angle wrestles in TNA. Do you care? <laughs> no. That leads us to the Knockouts Championship. ODB defends against Gail Kim and Brooke. And, you know, I can't say this about any match without uh, repeating myself, but it's true. Boring, 
Really nothing happens. And uh, the whole big spot that they looked like they were building to that would kind of like put some life into this was ODB setting the two up for a double superplex. Instead, they just kind of push her off and they're like, nah, don't do that spot. So that kind of just kills a lot of the energy. Then they knock the referee out. And this other woman who is new to the company that I actually didn't even hear of because I don't watch Impact, named uh, Tappa. What, what's it? Uh, Lady Tappa? Sounds about right. She comes out and ODB goes to attack her because, you know, that's what happens when somebody, you know, makes their entrance. You abandon your spot in the ring in a triple threat match and just go to fight them. Who books these things seriously? And Tappa beats her down. So you've got Gail Kim and Brooke in the ring. She goes over to the uh, to Brooke, gives her a power bomb. Looks like she almost botches it and almost uh, sl- slams um, Brooke to her on her neck. And then Gail Kim gets the pinfall. Now, they made a specific point of mentioning that the referee was down, and that's why. Uh, this wasn't a disqualification, which, according to Taz, too, and this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my fucking life, Taz is like, well, she never actually entered the ring when she gave her the power bomb, so I guess that's oh, why it's not a disqualification. No. It's a triple threat match. You don't need a disqualification anyway. That's and just like, really? Since when is it like it's only a disqualification if somebody attacks somebody inside of the ring? So you mean to tell me that if we had, like, Daniel Bryan against Randy Orton that somebody could just come to the ringside area and start beating the shit out of Daniel Bryan with a chair, and it'll be like, it's not a DQ. He's outside of the ring. <laughs> like, Yeah, and if he got in the ring and punched him. Right. Uh-oh. So, typical TNA logic. Stupid as hell. Uh, what did I'm you just think? think? I'm just thinking Jim Cornette face. Fuck this company. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about this, Sean? Uh, well, what threw me off about this match is um, when Gail Kim did the figure four on the ring post to Brooke, and the referee started counting. Yeah, was That's, I was like, I was like, what the fuck? Like, triple threat, a new DQ, and then the, the whole thing. Uh, the, uh, why did I watch it? <laughs> I was thinking this. Just why? Why am I doing this? And then it gets even worse too. That's the funniest thing. That's the backstage segment after that. Bromance is celebrating, and they start doing that champagne thing where you like you spill champagne all over the place, and you know have like a shower of champagne. But they do that with protein shakes, and they've got this person interviewing them who starts slipping around and pretending like it's so slippery that he can't walk away, and he does it so fucking over the top, like he sells the protein shake being on the floor being slippery. The way that Shawn Michaels sold the Hulk Hogan match. He's sliding around like a fucking retard. And like, it, it seemed, I, I put it in the uh, the review. It seemed like he was trying to do like a Benny Hill impersonata- impersonation or something. But terrible stuff just keeps going. There's actually a pretty decent promo with Bobby Roode, but he's way too good for TNA. Which leads to Bobby Roode against Kurt Angle. And I was disappointing, uh, disappointed in that, too. Were you, Sean? With what? The promo or the match or the entire thing or the... The, uh, the rude and angle match itself. It, it had some good spots, I suppose. Was it... Did it beat, or was it worse than their match two years ago at Bound for Glory? I don't remember too much about their match at Bound for Glory, but... I'm Not sure many people was, do. I'm sure it was better than this. There, there was a lot of cross Tony? faces. There was too many cross faces, too many head holds. Um, the only good spot about it was um, Kurt Angle doing his Olympic slam off the top rope. And then everybody was like, ooh, shit, his neck. And no, went on a stretcher. Like, this is awesome. Oh, yeah. Nowadays, every... this is gay. This <laughs> is gay. We want our money back. <laughs> Sorry, we, we don't have money it. Back. And then they did that we whole spot there it. with um, putting him on the stretcher and Kurt going, no, I don't want to go on the fucking stretcher and walked out. It's it very pointless. Yeah, Three is no excuse. 
free is no excuse. Uh, they make a point of being like, from this moment on, Kurt Angle's going to prove he's better than this and all this other kind of shit. Then he loses this match. Not only does he lose the match, but he loses it by supposedly injuring himself, botching his own finisher. To be fair, though, the bright man won. What, Bobby uh, Roode? Yeah, because um, I think they needed to give him his win back. They need to give him a WWE contract. <laughs> but... Yeah, they better, I, honestly, the, the fucking justice would be releasing him so WWE can pick him up. And this is something that I've noticed that TNA does a lot, too. During this match, we had maybe, like, five cross faces, maybe four ankle locks. Yes, I've noticed that. It's like the road agents aren't going around telling the guys, hey, they're using this in this match, don't do it in yours. Yeah, or a finisher is supposed to be a finisher instead of just another move. But Tanae even says, like, once you put that ankle lock on, you've got to tap out. And it's like, well, no, because he already had, like, four ankle locks on him earlier in the match and he didn't tap out. And lo and behold, he didn't have it. So oh, yeah, the referee spot, wasn't it? Yeah. Where he lifted up the arm. And what it was, Bobby Roode, you know, when you, when you pass out through pain, well, the referee lifts up your arm, doesn't he, and drops it. And um, he accidentally dropped Bobby Roode's arm on the rope, which was very dodgy. And then all the TNA fans were chatting, you screwed Kurt. Oh. One thing that was pretty decent, though, and not, that's because I didn't see Impact itself, but supposedly building up to this they had some kind of like ego itself we're doing the ego hall of fame and you could see that daniels uh and um what's his name kazarian that the two of them were dressed up in suits like dumb and dumber that orange and blue suit oh awesome (laughs) it's stupid as hell and it would look ridiculous on wwe tv but in tna why not goof off you know yeah, they probably, well, they, they fucking don't give a shit at this point. Daniels and Kazarian, they just have fun with it. We want our life back. <laughs> we want our life back. So, segment after that, Ethan Carter the Third makes his debut. And for those who don't know, that's Derek who? Bateman from TNA. Uh, from TNA, from WWE. Remember uh, Derek Bateman? Oh, fucking Daniel Bryan's uh, guy from NXT. Yeah, the one of uh, Chicks in America. Oh, yeah, that fucking amazing, talented individual. (laughs) I actually kind of like that. He was um, kind of Jewish. (laughs) How do you be kind of Jewish? Because he had, like, the Jewish hair and a nose. But he didn't sound Jewish. But he comes out, and apparently his character here is that he's Dixie Carter's nephew. And their big selling point is that the world needs the Carters. So that's why, like, Ethan Carter the Third is there to, like, save the fucking world or whatever. But he comes out to have his first match at TNA. And the person that comes out to face him is this dude who looks like a hybrid between Colin Delaney and Tom Green. Named, out of all things, Norv Furnum. <laughs> Norv Furnum for TNA champion. Right? It was the highlight of the fucking pay per view. <laughs> This fucking Norv Furnum dude. Like, this... This is the... The big fucking... Event of the year. And you've got this guy making this debut who you want to make, like, a top guy. It seems, by uh, pairing him up with Dixie Carter. And you give him, like, the Colin Delaney, Tom Green dude named Norv Furnum. <laughs> like... You know what? They should have fucking had him in, interrupt the uh, Hall of Fame segment to make his debut and kick the shit out of one of those guys or something. <laughs> they should have. But even worse, like, if you're going to do that, then you would think that they would have Ethan just beat the living shit out of him and be like, oh, come on, this guy's clearly not matched up to your skill and whatever. But they make Noah Fernand put up a fucking fight. Wait, they made this... <laughs> he almost wins. Oh, it was competitive? It was. <laughs> He's fucking drop kicking him and, like, beating wow. the shit out of him. You know what we should do? It was, it was we should a have close... a sign held up at TNA saying TNA is Furnum. <laughs> Jesus Christ, they can't even do a squash match, right? <laughs> no, he almost won. It was funny. Close call with a crossbody from the top rope. <laughs> no. Oh, no, Furnum's got a fad for life by M-Voice. I'm telling you. Let's go, Furnum. 
Exactly. Let's go and, further. And they were T- the TNA crowd were chanting, come on, Furnham, as well. It was fucking hilarious. It was like, wow, how much do we not give a shit about this guy? I think he needs to be the newest member of uh, the authority. So he should be the newest member of <laughs> the main event mafia. Main event mafia, yeah. I think he should lead the group. Oh, Norv. <laughs> Norv fucking Furnham, though. Like... We should get Norv on the show. <sighs> TNA won't be paying him that much. Yeah, let's, let's get Furnham on the show, Tony. Let's get him to, like, you know, be a part of the Smart Out Moment crew. <laughs> We'll be right, so it. when are you going to be TNA champion? Tomorrow. They're going to give him, like, the biggest push. <sighs> They've done it before. They've had people uh, lose their Bound for Glory match, and then the next night the championship gets changed and whatever. Maybe uh, AJ Styles will come out and drop the title to Norfernum. <laughs> Just be like, you know what? There's one person in this company that shows me. He's got the heart and determination that I used to have. And that it's Norfernum. <laughs> Brother, give it up. For you know Norf. what? I, I wouldn't even give, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even give him a last name. I'd just call him Norv. You know, you know what we could do? Alright. This is what's gonna happen. Dixie's gonna have her cronies surround the ring, beat up AJ Styles, and then Norfernum will come and make the save. And then you have today go, It's Norfernum! Norfernum has taken a stand. It would be brilliant. And his singlet looked too big for him as well. It was fucking hilarious. I'm sure it just wasn't Colin Delaney and they fucking just, like, renamed him. It looked like he could have been, like, his cousin or something like that. Like, uh, I don't know. You know, he kind of reminded me of Gibby. Was he talented? I mean, Colin's actually got some talent. <laughs> Gibby Furnham. <laughs> well, he's talented enough to almost beat Ethan Carter, apparently. Yeah, that's something. <laughs> and we know how talented the Carters are. Uh, so that was their big like lead in to the secondary main event of the night Sting versus Magnus which that the booking itself for this match makes no goddamn sense you've got aces and eights which is supposed to be like the the big faction of the company and you bring on the main event mafia to be you know that group that fends them off and fights against them so you would think that you'd see Main Event Mafia against the Aces and Eights at the biggest pay-per-view of the year, right? Nope, fuck it. Main Event Mafia versus Main Event Mafia. Yeah, what the hell are they thinking? Let's take uh, these two guys teaming up with each other, and we're going to have them face each other instead. Samoa was Sting... Joe was so depressed that he was comfort-eating over this. <laughs> By the way, was Sting wearing a Magnus t-shirt? Was no, it? he was wearing he was wearing a British um, Sting painted t-shirt. Oh, because I briefly just caught, like, a glimpse of this, and I was like, is he... I was confused. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's weird that they let him wear a t-shirt, period, because he's kind of like the fat kid at a pool party. Has he gotten to the Ric Flair stage where he's just depressed and wrestles in a t-shirt now? Woo! <laughs> it might be. <laughs> but, so we have the two people that are on the same team face off each other, because TNA Logic... They're just going to flat out say, Magnus is nowhere near as over as we were hoping that he would be at this point. So let's have him win a match that seems like it'll mean something. But who can we have him beat? We'll have him beat Sting. And Sting will come out there and we'll make the storyline about how Sting basically wants to lose to Magnus. (laughs) And when they do this, you know, they're supposed to be building up this kind of idea that uh stings like motivating magnus that whole like yo you need to have that fire within you and i'm gonna i'm gonna beat it out of you and you need to fight me back and you know all this other kind of stuff the match ends with magnus putting sting in a texas clover leaf and there's like no energy in the crowd and sting just kind of like nonchalantly taps out okay you beat me yeah it's just everybody's like that's the end of the match all right, and then of course Taz and today are like, "What a monumental win!" They uh, they flat out even called it a legendary match. Oh for fuck's sake! Taz is you... like, he just won this legendary match, and he's not giving Sting the proper uh, respect afterward because they kind of are hinting that he's going to turn heel now too. And join Dixie probably. Probably. 
legendary match. Like we're going to be hearing about this forever. You know, we're going to talk about the greatest matches in uh, wrestling history, and people are going to go, oh, you know, the the Iron Man match between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, or Shawn Michaels against the Undertaker, or how classic the Royal Rumble matches are after all these years. And remember that Sting and Magnus match? <laughs> like, <laughs> be like, no, I remember Norv Furnum more than I remember. <laughs> That was a classic. Do you remember when Norm Thurnham <laughs> came in and rocked the house and totally right. stole the show at a rather shitty pay per view? <laughs> Pepperidge Farm does. <laughs> Which leads us mm. into the main event. We all watched this main event. And I, since I've talked about the majority of all this kind of stuff, I'm going to go around the horn here. What did, what did you guys think about this, uh, Wago? <sighs> <laughs> Uh, as far as this match goes, it was very fucking lackluster. Like, AJ makes this ridiculously long entrance, and you guys may need to bring me up to speed here. I thought AJ was doing a thing now where he came out to... came out to evil ways, and then he breaks it into his old music. Did that stop now? I guess so. Because I, cause in this fucking pay-per-view, he just does this long entrance where everyone's like, oh, it's AJ. And then he tries to pop the crowd in the ring, and they're like, yeah... Woo. So that there took the energy out of the fucking match. And they just have this weird, almost, it's just like a weird brawl between the two, but then they're actually any wrestling. He fucking has this weird spot to the outside where he jumps out, which was kind of messed up. Um, so you make, they seem to make a big deal about Bully stripping the ring down. Then he just asks for a fucking steel chair. The fuck? <laughs> um, and all this fucking strip in the ring down, which just exposes that the wrestling ring's padded and makes it look fucking awful. Um, so, hey, guys, we're not fake. Um, then fucking gives him a back body drop on it and then goes to the top rope and does this horrific dive. It's like, yeah, that was horrible. And the whole thing was just weird. It's like the, I think they was trying to have AJ overcome the odds. But there was barely any involvement from the outside. It literally, Dixie just gave him a chair, and that was it. Yeah, we had um, Garrett Bischoff came out to cause like a little bit of a distraction. Oh, I missed it. That's how and, much I cared about this match. And with his big distraction is that AJ kind of like stares him down a little bit, and then he backs away and leaves. And <laughs> in the process, Bully Ray pulls out that hammer, and which that in itself, you don't need to have somebody call it, cause a distraction to pull out a hammer. You could have just pulled it out at the very beginning of the match because it's a no disqualification match. Again, the referees don't really pay attention. And he doesn't even hit him with the goddamn hammer. The hammer's he... stupid anyway. I mean, the amount of times people have been hit with a hammer and come back the next day, if I hit you with a fucking hammer, your skull's smashed in. I know it's pro wrestling, but that thing's... Right, at least, at least when uh, Triple H does that sledgehammer thing, he very clearly holds his hand over it and makes it, you know, like, pointless looking even the only time he does a good thing with a sledgehammer is when he does the swing to the back where only the sticks really hitting yeah and it makes it it gives you the visual image like if he's just swung down and crippled a guy but that's the only time i like the hammer in pro wrestling but yeah this match was fucking awful from beginning to end and he runs into the crowd celebrating with the fans that don't really give a fuck the fans that are all celebrating that the pay-per-view is finally over yeah <laughs> they're just like i get to go home this is fantastic but yeah their, their big spot with that whole exposing the ring is a back body drop and then basically like a senton bomb because that hurts more if you are on top of that not the fact that some like 300 pound guy jumped on top of you or, you know, if you really pay attention, completely missed you. Yeah, it's fucking... Ah, your shoulder touched me. I just... Uh, I don't know what to say about this. I mean, I can see that they really thought that this was going to be epic. But it's it just isn't. I mean, this well, is their they... biggest thing of the year. And it goes out with a whimper. All they had to do was match up some guys and say, have a good wrestling match, and they didn't achieve it. Mm -hmm. It was that fucking simple, and they blew it. Brahim, what did you think about this? What, the pay-per-view? About the uh, the match. Because I know you didn't watch the whole rest of the pay-per-view. Yeah, who won, who won the match between AJ and Bully Ray? 
<laughs> that about sums it up. That, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Sean, what do you think? Well, I think Dixie Carter deserves an Oscar for her superb acting <laughs> in this match. When she comes running down, well, strolling down the ramp, to stop a counter and says to Wilhelm, you count out, Bully Ray, you're going to be fired and shit. But yeah. It, it, yeah. It was almost like she didn't give a fuck about the pay-per-view. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, why am I here? I bet her parents don't give a fuck about it. It's like, just, they just fucking give her the money for TNA so they don't have to see her. <laughs> yeah, go run your company, you're a big girl. It's like her lunch money allowance for the week. <laughs> Yeah, she's been bad. That's why they're making all these cuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And this, you know, they, they're celebrating because, yay, AJ Styles defeated Aces and Eights that weren't really a threat anyway because they didn't do anything there isn't a pay-per-view except for one choke slam from uh, Nux on Where's tape. Anders? Did Anders never come back? I don't think so. Oh, cool. I think he's, like, <laughs> negotiating his contract or something like that. They're probably like, look, we've got, like, pennies, dude. Can we pay with IOUs? <laughs> well, I've got I'm negotiating know. my contract with Tina as we speak. And it's well, basically I'm gonna, me... I'm pull a lint. Well, mine is me paying them to leave me alone, you know? It's like, please get off the TV. Please, I'll be your friend. I'm working out a deal right now where I'll have a five-star classic match with Norv Furnham. Aw, oh, yeah. <laughs> Didn't you beat God? I think that should be like one of the biggest things in the world. <laughs> I bet you Smack Talk's gonna get more ratings than DNA's Bound for Glory. Uh, so I, I want to know what fuck a boy. I mean, who would spend their money on this shit? Probably sure a TNA that, fan. I'm sure that there's people that absolutely loved it, and if you are one of those people that absolutely loved it. I mean, yourself. if if you've been still paying attention to this review because you probably would have been mad enough that you would have been like, fuck you guys, you know, assholes, and whatever. But if you're, you know, somebody who watches Smack Talk and regularly knows that we don't like TNA, but we run these down anyway because people find it funny. If you did like this, please comment on the website and let me know what you thought. I have no problem with people disagreeing with me. I just really want to know what a fan of this liked. Because I don't really like any of this. I mean, it seemed like they had some ingredients that could have led to something good, but the execution was just failed on so many levels. Kind of like my recent experience with that Wendy's burger that they just introduced, that pretzel burger, where you're like, oh, it's a good idea, but man, is that horrible tasting. <laughs> That's what the matches is. on. Some of the matches on you were right. They had the good elements. I mean, if you had put Manic, Chris Saban, and who else was in the Ultimate X? Jeff Hardy, Jeff Hardy. Austin Aries. Like... Okay, all you needed was Austin Aries, Chris Saban, and Manic. They could have put on a really good match. Mm-hmm. The other guys are dragging the match down. Or even if you just had those other guys, but you actually wrestled an X Division match. Well, you could have just had them do a few spots and brawl on the outside and let those guys do the main work on the in-ring. Yeah. Like, that's not hard to, to think up. Like overbooking this and making these really half-assed endings that they they killed like any kind of enthusiasm that would have happened the reason that nobody's going to give a shit about magnus on the next episode of impact is because nobody gave a shit about the end of the match so there wasn't that big kind of uh emotion that you saw with like hbk and um rick flair their match wasn't the main event of the night but it was like the secondary main event and people gave a shit about that match. Yeah, sure, it was a retirement, but still, it wasn't the best match in the world. But when HBK hits that sweet chin music, people are like, oh, man, like, they're really into it. This, it was just kind of like, wait, this ended? Oh, I was too busy taking a piss. Like, so I, I guess it's official. Hogan's gone then. I mean, there's, room, there's rumors he was going to be on this pay-per-view, so. Yeah, you know what? That's right. I didn't even think about that. They did you rumor... Just... Uh, the rumor mill was buzzing that he was going to be in there, but yeah, but they re-signed him and he was going to be on uh, Bound for Glory, but I guess not. To be and fair, fair there was a whole Hogan guy in the crowd, though. <laughs> so <laughs> he made his appear as brother. <laughs> Maybe like the the spirit of Hulk Hogan lives on in Nerf Nerf Furnum, kind of like uh, the spirit of Eddie Guerrero moves on with Chavo Guerrero. <laughs> 
<laughs> all in all, though, awful pay-per-view. I don't know if I necessarily would say that it's as much of a disappointment as Battleground was, because at least with TNA going into it, I thought it was going to suck. Battleground, we thought it was going to suck, but it's WWE. You still expect a little bit more. But one count, pinfall, bad rating. Not a fan of it whatsoever. Judging by what you guys have heard, what would you, uh, are you going to listen to it or uh, watch it or read the re- results or anything different like that? Perhaps? Two words. Fuck no. <laughs> Wago? Hell to the fucking no. <laughs> and what did you think about this, Sean? Overall, uh, you give it a bad, a good, somewhere in the middle? Um, if it wasn't for no Furnum. I would say it was a bad pay-per-view because no Furnum was in it. And I am now president of his fan club. <laughs> I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. We should start a Norm Furnum fan club and have Norm for TNA champion. <laughs> I think there's truly one way to sum up this pay-per-view. <sighs> Sigh, indeed. Apparently, it's not even Norfernum. We've got that wrong this whole time. It's Norpernum. God, we can't even get the one good thing right about this paper, right? Shows how much we care. Anyway, that does us in for the pay per view talk. So let's do a little bit of plugs here. And let's start with Sean. Anything you want to plug? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to plug my uh, Twitter page, um, SeanAC2K37. Um, if you want to follow me and everything Norfernum. <laughs> I'm on there. Um, also, check my YouTube um, page out, which is um, youtube.com forward slash Shaughnessy1989. And yeah, no Fornum rules. Everybody draws. Brilliant. No Fornum for life. Um, nerdgenius.com, fanboysanonymous.com. I got gameplay 8 p.m. on Toku Nation, which was today at 8 p.m. Uh, so check out the archives on that. We talk everything Attack on Titan, which nearly made me throw up my dinner. Um, and also I'm doing a live coverage of the IP Expo. Go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TheNerdGenius to check that out. And it will also be posted in the article form on fanboysanonymous.com. So make sure you guys check that out. Some interesting tech stuff going on and a lot of stuff to, um, talking about, including data security, cloud storage, and all those other little buzzwords. So if you want to find out what they are, uh, ask Tony, because I have no clue. <laughs> Where you go? I think the Dream Elite Nerd Herders should be Nov Herders from now on. <laughs> Nov Mania is running wild. Um, for me, um, I've actually got my week pretty cleared um, this week, so I'm going to be doing the, the Monday post-Raw show, keeping kayfabe on Thursday, and I've got you, Dynamous Decision, MMA, every Tuesday at 8pm Eastern Standard. We just came off a really good pay-per-view as opposed to TNA, um, UFC 166, where we probably saw fight of the century between Diego Sanchez and Gilbert Melendez. So check that out for all my uh, thoughts on that. That's over on Dream Elite. And that does it for me. And that actually does it for all of us. Remember, guys, coming up later on in this week, we're going to have episode 103, Hell in a Cell pay-per-view predictions, hot tags going on with wrestling news and rumors and speculation and everything like that, all the stories that are happening on this week in wrestling. Ask him the wrestling trivia question. We're going to do the YouTube comment of the week, our stupid little outro song that we do all the time. Anything else that happens uh, in the next couple of days, we'll be talking about... If you want to check out my opinions on wrestling that I don't have on SmartOutMoment.com, you can check out everything with Bleacher Report. You can go to FanboysAnonymous.com for everything geek. OutOnLimbs.com for all the other opinions of the A-Mango Tree mindset. And that'll do us in for this dark match. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of it, everybody who was on the mic this evening. We will see you next time. This has been another Smart Out Moment. And we are being counted out.